Well, good to see you here on this Memorial Day weekend. We're going to continue in our Bible study through the book of Isaiah. So if you'll take your Bibles, please, and join me in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be chapter 26 today. Isaiah chapter 26. We only have a few Bibles left in this service to distribute if you didn't bring a Bible. So if you happen to see an usher down your aisle, you can raise a hand. Otherwise, if you don't see an usher down your aisle, maybe take your phone and go online and look up Isaiah 26 because that's where we're going to be today. And I'm only going to actually read two verses from Isaiah 26. You can thank me later. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you're getting out early, so don't, don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, but I only have two verses to read. These are going to be the, the, the two verses for our text today out of Isaiah chapter 26. It's page 500 in those church Bibles, Isaiah 26, page 500 of the church Bibles. And here are the verses we're going to look at, chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. It says this, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. Let's pause there and pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful now as we open up our Bibles and we study this passage and we look at this section of Scripture, and we pray as always that you would use your word to minister to our hearts. We know the promise of your word that it will not return void, but as it goes forth, it will accomplish the purposes for which it is sent. You know us individually. You know the purposes that we have need of in our lives today. And so I trust that you'll take these verses and you'll speak to our hearts. If we've heard these verses before, you'll speak to our hearts afresh. If we've never heard these verses, that you will, in a, in a wonderful, profound way, minister your love and your grace through this passage of Scripture today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. For those of you who like to take notes, you need to recognize and jot down that Isaiah chapters 24 through 27 are intended to be read as one section. Isaiah 24 to 27 has often been called by some Bible scholars as Isaiah's apocalypse, because in these chapters, uh, God gives Isaiah insight and a vision about things related to the end times. And much of what Isaiah writes about in these four chapters have to do with future events that even are beyond our present, present day. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to look at a quick survey of chapters 24 through 27, and then we're going to drill down on the verses that I read at the beginning of our Bible study. But, but just so that we can understand the context in which he writes here and, and just an overview of these apocalyptic chapters, for those of you who like to take notes, here's the first thing. Chapter 24 is about the judgment of the earth. If you flip in your Bibles back to chapter 24, I'm just going to do a quick gallop through these chapters, so follow along if you could with me in your Bibles. But in chapter 24, first three verses, it says this, see the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. And so Isaiah here in the opening few verses tells us that the earth will be devastated, that the earth will be laid waste, and that the inhabitants will be scattered without regard for social class. Because that's why Isaiah talks about whether you're a priest or just people, whether you're a master, servant, mistress, or maid, that the, the Lord is going to bring devastation upon the earth, and it doesn't have anything to do with whatever social status you happen to belong to. This is coming. And Isaiah looks way in the future. God gives him insight about what is going to happen when judgment comes to the earth. And he's looking at a day even beyond our own. But in chapter 24 alone, Isaiah uses the word earth 16 times. Talks about the judgment that is coming to the earth, the earth, the earth. And the book of Revelation bears this out as well. For you note takers, you can write in the margin of your Bibles, Revelation chapter 8, verses 7 to 11. 
Now, you don't need to turn there, but I'm going to read these verses that are a complement to what Isaiah is writing here in chapter 24. Here's what John sees in the revelation that God gives him in Revelation 8, verse 7. He says, The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So try to imagine the devastation from cataclysmic natural disasters that will come at the hand of God upon the earth when vegetation is impacted in such a way that a third of the trees are destroyed and all green grass, all green grass. So now think about how this translates to livestock. How will this affect livestock that grazes on grass? Continuing in Revelation 8, verse 8, John says, The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. Now, John's writing in the first century, but what he's describing is probably what we would call an asteroid. And he says, A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So this great asteroid plunges into the ocean, it affects salt water, it affects ocean life and shipping commerce. And then John goes on to say, the third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. So now it impacts fresh water. He said, the name of the, of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Some say this is a nuclear disaster, Wormwood can translate Chernobyl, and we know the Chernobyl event that happened in the 80s, uh, eight metric tons of radioactive material uh, uh, was dispersed at the nuclear power meltdown in Chernobyl, 8,000 people died, 200,000 people were um, permanently physically um, diseased as a result of it. Listen, that, that might be a, a foreshadowing, but that certainly is not a fulfillment because a third of the fresh water was not affected from that event. But it, it might give us a glimpse into something that is coming because it affects a third of the fresh water. It could also be referring honestly to a comet which impacts the earth and affects the fresh water. Comets contain ammonia and methane, which are toxic gases. And so who knows? But the point is that devastation is going to come upon the earth at some day in the future. It's part of God's judgment upon the earth. Don't look at this and think to yourself, what kind of a loving God would do this? Now, I know a lot of skeptics will approach God in that way. If God was such a loving God, why would he impact the earth and, and devastate it in such a way? Let me ask you a question. When, when you learned some of the best lessons in your life, did it come through the good times or the bad times? It often comes through the bad times. And when God brings judgment upon the earth, it is his last wake-up call to a God-forsaking, Christ-rejecting world. Sometimes God will go to an extreme because people are so stubborn in their hearts and they've rejected him for so long that God will bring cataclysmic natural events and disasters upon the earth to wake people up because he doesn't want any to perish. So before he returns, there's going to be the unleashing of this devastation upon the earth. And this is what Isaiah sees. This is what John sees in Revelation. And by the way, forgive me in advance, because I get emails when I say stuff like this, but when you read your Bibles and you see how the world is going to be completely devastated, how the earth is going to be destroyed, and not just here, but in other places. In 2 Peter 3.10, it talks about how the earth is going to, you know, just completely disintegrate and burn, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But when you read your Bibles and you understand what is going to happen to the planet, this is why it just, it grates on me the whole thing about, you know, save the planet, hug a tree, carbon footprint, recycle. <laughs> why? <laughs> it's all going to be destroyed. Now listen, if you want to hug a tree, fine, hug a tree. I love trees. But don't hold it too tightly because it's going to burn. <laughs> and you don't want to burn with it, baby, all right? So just hold it loosely. Okay, now look, I'm not advocating mistreating the planet. Whenever I talk like this, people are like, it's God's green earth, you should take care of it and be good. I understand, okay, let's treat God's green earth, you know, with, with respect. But all I'm saying is, it's going to burn one day. Don't idolize it. And that's the problem in our culture today. It's trending towards idolizing the planet. And that's what happens when you take God out of the equation. When you take God out of the equation, then now suddenly the planet is the biggest thing to you. 
you see. And it's why Romans 1 speaks about this. Romans 1.25 says there's going to come a day, and I think we're living in it, when people, instead of worshiping the Creator, will worship created things. And we will idolize created things rather than the Creator. We're more concerned about the whale and the spotted owl than we are about unborn babies. We've, we've inverted God's whole system of what is right. Isaiah says, listen, one day God's judgment is going to come upon the earth, and there will be devastation, and it will be laid waste. Isaiah sees it. And he also points out in the next chapter, chapter 25, Isaiah writes about the fulfillment of the kingdom. If you'll go to chapter 25 with me in your Bibles, and let me just read verses 6 through 9. In verse 6, he says, on this mountain, he's talking about Jerusalem, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Amen to that. And the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth, and the Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So Isaiah, now this is, again, not in chronological order, but Isaiah sees the fulfillment of the kingdom. He sees a day when the Lord will rule from the mountain, meaning Jerusalem, the holy mount of God. And he, and he prophesies about how in that day, God will take away the shame of the people, and they will end up declaring, surely this is our God, we trusted in Him, and He saved us. And this will be the ultimate vindication of the righteous when Jesus comes again, the Bible says, and He will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And then after that, this earth will be destroyed, present heavens will be destroyed, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it will actually join together, Revelation talks about, the new city of Jerusalem on the new earth where we will be with the Lord forever. But this millennial reign that Isaiah sees, this fulfillment of the kingdom, is something that will also happen, and it will be a glorious day of rejoicing when Jesus is the sole ruler of the planet. Won't that be a glorious day? That'll be a wonderful, glorious day. It's hard for us to even imagine it now. But, you know, no, no political fighting, no different kingdoms, no different kings, just, just one King Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning over the whole planet. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. Okay, that's what we pray now. But one day his kingdom will be here, established on earth for a thousand years. What a glorious day that shall be when we will rule and reign with him. Now, before all of that, Isaiah writes about in chapter 26, go over to chapter 26, he writes the next thing about the punishment of the wicked. Last few verses of chapter 26, look at verses 20 and 21. He says this, go my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you, hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Notice that, it's a proof text about how the righteous are preserved from the day of God's wrath. And in verse 21, see the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed upon her. She will conceal her slain no longer. So it is both a picture of the righteous being preserved and spared from the wrath of God, which is consistent also with other pictures of the saints or the righteous being preserved from God's wrath. You have Lot and his family who were preserved from the wrath of God during the time of God's judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. You have Noah and his family being preserved as the righteous from the wrath of God during the day of the flood. And you will have the saints who are preserved from the wrath of God during the day of tribulation. So the punishment that comes upon the earth are for those who have rejected God, had forsaken Christ, not for those who have already yielded their hearts to the Lord. Okay, there will be a day of reckoning for every human being. But when you come to trust Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you surrender your life to His Lordship, the day you surrender your life to His Lordship is your day of reckoning. 
That is the day that you then are judged righteous, not because of our own merit, but because of the righteousness of Christ that we trust by faith in His finished work on a cross. He dies. He pays the price for my sin, for your sin. He takes the punishment intended for me. That is my day of reckoning then. I exercise my faith. I trust Christ because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So we don't face a judgment who have trusted Christ as our Savior because judgment has been satisfied for us on the cross when we receive Christ as our Savior. So that's the good news here. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 reminds us of this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And then Paul adds a verse after that. He says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Because you see, what Christ did for us on the cross was to pay that price for us so that our sins are not counted against us. We can be forgiven. We trust Christ as our Savior. He died on my behalf. And thus, we pass from death to life. But Isaiah sees a day where punishment comes upon the wicked who have rejected God and forsaken him. And then lastly, just in this quick survey, and then we'll get to the verses that we opened up with, chapter 27 is about the reestablishment of Israel, which is also something prophetic that Isaiah sees. In chapter 27, if you look at verse 2, he says, in that day, talking about a future day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. Now, Isaiah has already told us in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, that the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. So this passage here in chapter 27 is about Israel, and Isaiah says, in that day, sing about Israel, sing about a fruitful vine. He says in verse 3, I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. And so God watches over Israel, takes care of Israel, and then look at verse 6. In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Now, the day that, in which Isaiah writes, the Assyrian Empire has besieged the northern kingdom. So it's a dark day. And 135 years afterwards, the Babylonian Empire is going to besiege the southern kingdom. So what Isaiah is seeing is way beyond his own day. He's seeing to a day that in part has been fulfilled because he speaks here about the reformation of the nation of Israel and how it will come together and God will cause her to become fruitful again and and bud and blossom. And so in May May 14th, 1948, in part, this was fulfilled, the reestablishment of Israel coming back together. And then this amazing prophecy here in verse 6 where he says, "And, and then... Because Jacob will take root and Israel will bud and blossom, they will fill all the world with fruit. You know, amazingly, that Israel, smaller than the state of New Jersey, but is the 15th largest on the list of the the most productive in terms of exports in value of all the countries on the planet, Israel is 15th in the export of fresh fruits and vegetables around the world. Among all the countries in the world, smaller than the state of New Jersey, has God not caused Israel to bloom and blossom and spread fruit around the world? It has. We see part of this fulfilled even in our own lifetime. And it wasn't always like this. Before the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, 1948, listen to what Mark Twain wrote when he visited Israel in 1867 about just how devastated the land looked. This is what he wrote in his book, The Innocents Abroad. Mark Twain wrote, quote, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country, end quote. Well, that's what Mark Twain saw in 1867. But since the reformation of Israel in 1948, my, how God has caused the land of Israel to be fruitful, to even bless much of the rest of the world. All right, so that's the overview of this section. 
Isaiah prophesies about things that are to come, the judgment and destruction of the earth, punishment of the wicked, reestablishment of Israel, the coming of the kingdom. Nestled right in the middle of all of this are these verses we started with from chapter 26. Look again at your Bibles. I'll put them up on the screen. Verses 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Now, the fact that, that these verses are nestled right in the middle of all this apocalyptic information speaks to me in two ways. Number one, what it says to me that is, is this. In the midst of tribulation, capital T, because there will be a time of tribulation that comes upon this earth. That's what we read about. In the midst of tribulation, capital T, God's people will have peace. And God's people will have peace in large part because when you read the whole counsel of Scripture, we won't be here for the tribulation. That God will take us from the earth and keep us safe, that we will not experience His wrath, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 among other verses that speak about how we will not experience His coming wrath. Okay, so we will experience His peace during the Great Tribulation, capital T, but it also says this to me. That the reason I think why Isaiah has this right where he does is because he wants everybody who will ever read this to know that God's people in the midst of tribulation, small t, will experience God's peace. You and I will experience over the course of our lifetime, tribulation. Small t, various trials, various difficulties, various heartaches, things that we go through that we didn't imagine and weren't prepared for. And God wants us to know that even in tribulation, small t, that's compared to, comparatively to tribulation coming upon the earth, not to diminish whatever you're going through. But God wants us to know that even through tribulation, small t, his perfect peace will be with us. His perfect peace will be with us. So I'm going to unpack this passage with us. The first thing I want us to focus on, I highlight the words, you will keep. You will keep. Now, the you in this passage, obviously, is God. God will keep. Because God is a keeping God. And the Hebrew word for keep is natsar. In the original Hebrew language, natsar. God is a keeping God, natsar. It means to protect. It means to guard. That God will guard us in all our ways, and God will protect us in all our ways because He is a keeping God. Now, don't misunderstand me. When we talk about God being a keeping God, it does not necessarily mean that He will keep you from. Sometimes He will. But we also need to appreciate His keeping power through. Sometimes God keeps us from, sometimes God keeps us through. You know, the default for all of us is, God, spare me from going through anything difficult. Keep me from. God is a keeping God, and He will often keep us from. But if all He ever did was to keep us from, how would we ever see His mighty hand? He has to keep us through in order for us to recognize His grace and His power and His provision for us. Now, I mean, think about it. If God always prevented us from ever experiencing any heartache, any difficulty, any trial, we would never know. We would never know. So what God does is, I'm sure, prevent us from experiencing things. And we need to regularly thank God for things that He's saved us from that we don't even know. But we will often most recognize His saving grace because He keeps us through in the midst of it. You know, take the story, for example, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon at that time. It's the most powerful kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar commands everybody to fall down and worship me. This is what Nebuchadnezzar says. These three Jewish boys who were taken against their will from the land of Israel as slaves, they are now in the king's palace serving there as part of the king's team there. They refuse to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar because they will only worship the one true and living God. So he throws them into this fiery furnace. Many of you know the story. It's often reduced to just a children's story, which is kind of weird when you think about it because, hey, kids, look at these three kids thrown into the fire. 
I don't know why we share it as a bedtime story, but anyway, it has a good ending. Kids, just don't look at them in the fire right now because it's all good. But anyway, they come out of the fire, and as you know the story, it was a miracle. But in the midst of the fire, what did Nebuchadnezzar see through some window of the furnace? He saw one like the Son of God. Because it was Jesus who showed up in the fiery furnace to be there with them, to sustain them and help them. And then when he rescued them from it, and Nebuchadnezzar gave orders like, get them out, get them out, get them out. Not even the smell of smoke on their garments. God is a keeping God, but if he had prevented Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from ever experiencing it, we would never have seen in that case the mighty deliverance and the power of God. And now it's written and preserved for our benefit so that we can be reminded God is a keeping God. He keeps us from, no doubt, but we most often see his great power displayed when he keeps us through and he helps us through it. God is a keeping God. Look at the next part of the passage, in perfect peace. In perfect peace. Now, in the margin of your Bible, you might want to write down that the word perfect is not in Hebrew. What is in Hebrew is a repetition of the same word peace. It's given to us twice. In Hebrew, it reads shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. And it is written in duplicate because it's written for emphasis, that God is saying, I will give you my peace upon peace. I will give you multiplied peace. I will give you undisturbed peace. This is shalom, shalom. That's God's peace. Now, please understand with me that peace is not the absence of strife. Because Jesus even warned us, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. So peace is not the absence of strife, but if we want a working definition of it, here would be one, that God's peace is a deep down calm and quiet confidence of the soul. And it comes from the presence of the Lord because Ephesians 2.14 says, for he himself is our peace. So when everything's going crazy in your life and bombs are exploding in your life, to have God's peace means that you have this calm, this deep down calm and this quiet confidence in your soul that God gives. Jesus even said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus even acknowledged there in John 16, the kind of peace that he offers us is, is not the peace you will find in this world. The peace of this world is very circumstantial. You're at peace when everything's fine, and then you and I are terrified when everything's not fine. And God's peace is this constant so that whether life is great or life is hard, there's this constant abiding, deep down calm and quiet confidence in our soul. And I love the way that Isaiah describes it a little further in his book, listen, you don't need to turn there, but Isaiah 48, listen to verses 17 and 18. He says, I am the Lord your God who, touches, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. And he says this, this is Isaiah 48, 18. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river. I love that. That's chapter 48, verse 18. God says, if you'll only listen to me, obey me, if you only will receive from me, because I have your best interest at heart, I'm your loving Father, if you will obey me, my peace will roll into your life like a river. Like a river. And this is the very thing that Horatio Spafford was referring to in the great hymn of our faith, It Is Well With My Soul. When after the tragic death of his four daughters at sea, Horatio Spafford chartered a boat, went out to the spot roughly where the ship sank and his daughters died, and he wrote, it is well with my soul. And he starts out that song by saying, when peace like a river attendeth my way. It's Isaiah 48, 18. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, now, what's the difference between a river and sea billows? The difference is that a river is constantly flowing, constantly. Sea billows are waves. They come one, delay, delay, delay. They come again, delay, delay, delay. That's the nature of sea billows. But the nature of a river is constantly rushing, constantly flowing. 
So Horatio Spafford understood. He said, in the midst of my despair and my pain, I understand the difference between the way that sorrow comes one at a time in waves and the way that God's peace is constant. It's constant. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your constant, ever-flowing river of peace. That's the difference. This is the kind of peace that we can have. The peace like a river, which is why then he can write the rest of that passage in, 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 in that song, whatever my lot, whatever happens, good or bad, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He didn't deny the sorrow. He didn't pretend the sorrow wasn't there. He said, but the sorrow comes in moments, in waves, but the peace of God flows constantly like a river, and that, that is what will sustain me. God has his shalom, shalom for us, his perfect peace. But now, listen, this part is on us. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. The New King James and ESV says, him whose mind is stayed on you. So that's the idea here, that a steadfast mind is a, is a stayed mind fixed on God. Now, why is this so important? Because if, if you don't wrestle with the mind and get the mind together, okay, you will not be able to enjoy and experience God's perfect peace. See, God is a keeping God, and he's got a double portion of his peace, shalom, shalom. But the part that is on us is to keep our minds steadfast. The Hebrew word for mind is yetzer, and it means thoughts and imaginations. And all of us have wrong or bad thoughts and imaginations. All of us do. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and confess mine, and if you want to tell me years later, I'll use it for the last service. <laughs> but I'm the kind of guy, and I'm not proud of it, I'm just saying this is something I have to work on hard. I'm the kind of guy that what comes into my mind when something looks like it could go wrong is the first place my mind goes is the worst case scenario. That's where my mind goes. Now, some of you are chuckling because you're in my support group, aren't you? You know what I'm talking about. So, so some scenario comes about, and then immediately your mind goes to the worst thing. And so you, you, you begin to, and some of you might think, well, Pastor G, I, I thought you were a positive guy. <laughs> I am. I'm positive something bad is going to happen. <laughs> and, and I have to wrestle with it constantly. Now, listen, I prayed about this years ago, and the Lord helped me to identify the root of it. And I'm going to tell you what the root of it is. When I was a kid, I was told devastating news that I was unprepared for, and it rattled me. And so without even knowing it for years, subconsciously, I just then deferred to thinking worst-case scenario, and here's, and here's what I thought, subconsciously, I thought, if I could prepare myself for the worst news, then I will at least be prepared. If it doesn't happen, then great. But if it does happen, then at least I'll be prepared in some way. Anybody ever thought like that? Come on, I know I'm not the only one. Confess with me right now. Let me see a show of hands. All right. So here's what's going on, though. 95%, and it might be 99%, but I'm just that kind of guy. 90, <laughs> 95% of the time never even happened. And I wasted a whole lot of time thinking about the worst case scenario. So here's what has to happen, because I don't know what you might wrestle with in your mind, but I guarantee you every single one of us, without exception, wrestle with some kind of thoughts that we need to make steadfast. It might be thoughts of fear, anxiety. It might be thoughts of lust or anger. It might be thoughts of bitterness or revenge. It might be thoughts of self-harm or unforgiveness. You name it. All of us have to understand this, and this verse is going to become your very best friend. It has for me over the course of my life. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Write it down. Here's what it says. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The mind is a wonderful thing. It is one of the most complex organs and God has designed a very complex and wonderful organ, our mind. But left unchecked, 
left unbridled, our thoughts can play games with us. And our thoughts can rob us of our peace. So God says to us, I'm the keeping God. I've got a double portion of my peace, shalom, shalom. But here's your part. You need to fix your mind on me. That's what he says to us. You have to fix your mind on me. The Hebrew word for steadfast is somach. It means to lean, to rest, to lie hard, to prop. We need to prop our minds on the Lord so that in our everyday routines, we're washing the dishes, we need to think about the Lord. We're driving to work, think about the Lord. Get into his word, think about the Lord. Constantly just be thinking about the Lord and dwelling on him and taking captive every thought and making it obedient to Christ so that we shall not be robbed of God's perfect peace because an unbridled mind will rob us of God's perfect peace. And then the rest of this passage has to do with trust. So I'll just kind of highlight the rest of it. I'll underline the words trust. You will keep in perfect peace, God, him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. And I love the way that Isaiah ends that passage describing God as a rock. He's our rock, and he's our rock eternal. The rock is a picture of one who is dependable, that he will never fail us, that he is strong and mighty. So Isaiah says, trust him, trust him. He's the rock eternal. But there's a tricky thing about trust. Trust requires faith. Sometimes it's hard to trust because trust implies that something is not always tangible. And so God calls us to put our faith in him and trust him. You know who are the most wonderful examples of faith and trust? Children. Because children are so quick to trust. They're easy to trust. And, and because they're so quick to trust, we actually have to warn them as parents. Now, you know, stranger danger, don't talk to strangers. And, you know, don't take candy from people you don't know. And all that kind of stuff. It's terrible, but we live in a dangerous world now. So we're always trying to temper our kids' trust. But we, we want them to be trusting people. But then we're like, you know, be trusting people, but don't trust anyone. You know, and that's the kind of thing. And it's this mixed message that we're sending. But I just love the way that kids are just such a perfect picture of trust. And the reason that they trust so easily, listen to me on this, is because they always give the benefit of the doubt. You've done them no harm, so they have no reason to distrust you, you see. That's why they're so trusting. They always believe the best in another person until that person were to ever spoil that trust. And so the kid stands on the edge of a swimming pool with the inflated water wings pulled up to their armpits, ready to go. And mom or dad is in the pool, in the water. Like, come on, honey, come on, come on, jump, jump. First time in the pool, come on, you can do it. Daddy's right here, mommy's right here. We got this, you'll be fine. And then they take that plunge off of the edge of the swimming pool. And they come up spitting water, and you're holding them and hugging them. And they have this smile on their face because they realize that, in fact, you were there. You, you were reliable. You said, I got you, it's going to be okay. And they trusted you, and it was. And that's the way we need to be with our Father in heaven. We need to always think the best of him. He's never done anything to break our trust. He's never lied to us, deceived us. He's always been there for us. And he's the one in the water saying, come, come to daddy. Come on, I got this. I got this. I got this. Oh, may we learn from children to trust our heavenly Father in the same way. God's got this, church, so trust him. Let's say this verse together, uh, and th which is what trust is, the firm belief in the reliability of God. It is believing that he loves you, that he's good, that he has the power to help you, that he wants to help you, and that he will help you. So let's say this verse together and out loud, can we? You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. Lord, this is our prayer, that we would be people who would trust you, that we would fix our minds and our thoughts on you, 
because you are a keeping God and your perfect peace is available to your children. Help us, Lord, as we stand at the edge of the pool to just leap into your arms to trust you. We don't know what the future holds, but we trust you. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we trust you. And we thank you for your peace that rolls in like a river to satisfy our souls with a a deep down calm and a quiet confidence that no matter what is going on, a double portion of your peace is there for us. Thank you, Lord, for being our Father. Thank you for loving us. We give you praise and glory and honor. And we ask you, Lord, for your help to apply these verses we've read. And I pray for those right now who are going through great difficulties, great challenges in their own personal lives. These verses will continue to minister to them throughout the week, throughout our lives. That you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you, Lord, because she trusts in you. Show yourself strong in our lives, Lord. We're needy people and we're grateful for your peace. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen, amen.